Should we go or wait? Yeah, it's 8.30. 
Yeah. Anyway, just go ahead. Always want us to start okay. Yeah. All right. Good morning. So uh, I'm Sally Horn Dadabinik, and I'm going to be co chairing this first plenary, plenary session with Justin D'Angelo and RDM Cop. And I just want to say, you know, to start out, last night was not a dream. We are all still here in person, enjoying great science and great colleagues. So, uh, very quickly, we're going to one quick announcement that if this room becomes a little full and you're uncomfortable with the density, there is room next door in town and country B where everything is being streamed if you wanna spread out and get a little more room. And then our first order of business this morning is Dan Bergstrahl will be presenting the Drosophila Image Award. Hmm. How do I open this? Not working. I don't see a cursor. Uh, okay. I see a cursor there. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Good morning. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to be here today to uh, present the Drosophila Image Award for 2022. Uh, as usual, we had a stellar group of uh, applicants to choose from, and that was done by committee. I think it's normal when you present an award to do so with a little bit of humor uh, but recent events have suggested that's not the best idea. I just want to point out that the chair and I both have short military style haircuts and uh, we're, we're strongly in favor of those. Okay. All right. So moving forward. Yeah. Uh, uh, moving forward, as I said, we had a stellar group. Uh, I'm going to describe the honorable mentions. Uh, we are presenting both um, still images and live movies. Uh, here are some of our honorable mentions. Ting Ting Juan, uh, Jasmine Alsus. I'm quite fond of that. Uh, Wai Chen Chu, Chan Hee Soon, and Logan Walker. Uh, and now to our awards the second runner up in the still image category, Bitbo reveals neuropile densities, domains, and branching patterns. So there's the larval central nervous system, very beautiful, from Ye Li. Uh, our first runner up is Alexandra Lubojemska and Izumi Yoshimura for nephrocyte endocytosis. And the winner is super resolution microscopy uh, demonstrating uh, the architecture of the centrosome as it develops. From Yuan Chan, Yushan Yan, and Ying Yang, uh, excuse me, Jing Yang Fu. Okay, so now to the video category, our second runner up, close to my heart is development of a Drosophila egg chamber in the, uh, in the larva. So this is budding process of the very first egg chamber. I hope you can see that it's colored there in green from Helen Kogan. The first runner up is three-dimensional live imaging with light sheet microscopy, live imaging of the embryo. Yeah, I think I heard a woo. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. I agree. That's pretty awesome. From Mustafa Akta. And the winner is Kay Yang. Uh, high resolution imaging of the ER Golgi interface through FibSem.
Okay, so uh, please submit your, yes. Please remember to submit your images and movies for next year. Uh, we'll have a new chair uh, as of next year and we would love to see your submissions. Thank you. All right, well, that's inspiring. Um, okay, so we're gonna have three great talks this morning and four great talks this morning, four. And uh, <laughs> this is good. All right, so uh, before we get into the science, I wanna discuss uh, the protocol we're gonna use for questions because we do have a group joining us online. This is a hybrid meeting. And so as chairs, here in the room, if you come up to the microphones, please don't just launch in with your question. We will be calling on you because we'll also be integrating questions uh, from online. And for those of you who are online, this is just a quick reminder to please put your questions into the Q&A. Okay. All right. So our uh, very first talk this morning will be from Lucy O'Brien from Stanford University. And she's gonna tell about, about the role of stem cells in maintaining gut homeostasis. All right, thank you, Sally, for that introduction. I wanna thank the organizers for this very, very special invitation to speak at this meeting. Now, I think I'm in really good company when I say that this is my first meeting since the pandemic started. And looking back at 2020 when we were in lockdown, the joke going around with my friends is that if COVID ever ends, we'll either be a chunk, a monk, a hunk, or drunk. <laughs> but here we are, it's 2022, we're vaccinated, we're boosted, and we are together live in person in San Diego and on Zoom. Hello, you folks out there. And what this really speaks to for me is our amazing resilience as humans to adapt to external events that we couldn't possibly have foreseen. Now, this ability to adapt to unforeseen environmental change, this is a universal property of all living systems. And it's arguably what distinguishes living systems from non-living systems. We see this across all scales of biology from human behaviors in a pandemic to met metabolic pathways in our body, cellular processes like immunity, signal transduction networks, and down to the evolutionary forces that control our DNA. Now, our lab likes to think about adaptation to environmental change at the cell to organ scale in terms of the multicellular communities that make up our organs. We often think of mature organs as being in a sort of homeostatic state of self-renewal. But throughout our lifetimes, our organs will break out of this self-renewing state in order to respond to external events. This lets them, for instance, undergo repeated cycles of injury and repair, or repeated cycles of growth and shrinkage in response to changes in functional demand. An organ's ability to flexibly move between these different states comes down to the nature of its cellular collective. Cell types that we might generically refer to as stem cells, immature cells, mature cells, and apoptotic cells. These cell types 
form a dynamic continuum, one that C.P. Lebon back in the 1940s called a cellular life cycle. Now, a lot of attention has been paid to the molecular signals that propel cells through the cycle. But what really captivates our lab is how you take many, many, many individual cell life cycles and orchestrate them in time and in space so that the organ can either maintain a given state or flexibly move between states. Now, this question is fundamental across metazoans. It affects every self-renewing organ that we have. But if we wanna really dive into it, we need a system that lets us readily bridge from single cell to whole organ states in vivo. And fortunately, our favorite model organism has given us just such a system, the adult mink gut. The mink gut's functionally equivalent to the vertebrate stomach and small intestine. We focus on this compartment of the mid gut right here, it has about 3,000 cells. 2,000 of these are enterocytes. Their nuclei are in blue in this image, and it's the enterocytes that are the workhorses for the gut's digestive function. About 500 of these cells are stem cells. Their nuclei are in red, and the stem cells continually divide to replace dying enterocytes. But when a stem cell divides, its terminal daughter goes through a transition state we call an enteroblast before maturing into one of these terminal enterocytes. These enteroblasts are in yellow in this image and there's about 400 of them. And it's these transitional enteroblasts that'll be the stars of my talk today. And what really opened up the opportunity for us to study cell life cycles in vivo was live imaging. A few years ago, we developed a way to image the gut inside a living fly. We call this protocol window mount because we expose the gut through a window cut into the fly's dorsal cuticle. With this approach, the fly can continue to eat, digest food, and even poop all while we're imaging its gut. And we can image its gut overnight and then come back in the morning to a fly that's very much still alive. Here's an example of the kind of movies we get. This is eight hours in the life of, an, of a midgut. The nuclei of the enterocytes are in blue. The cytoplasms of the stem cells and enteroblasts are in yellow. And these tidal waves that you see ricocheting through the gut, these are peristaltic contractions of the gut tube as the gut digests food. So with this approach, we can watch stem cells divide, watch enteroblasts differentiate, watch enterocytes die and be shed, all happening in real time in an organ that's physically functioning inside a live animal. Today, I'm gonna to tell you an unpublished story that uses window mount imaging to look at how life cycle dynamics alter to enable a different tissue state, in particular, a state of injury repair. This is the PhD work of Aaron Sanders, a fantastic graduate student who's recently left the lab. And she was helped along the way by two undergrads, Andrew Labat and Javeria Idris, along with our lab manager, Elsa Su, and a new student, Miriam Sun. So here's one of Aaron's window mount movies of a healthy gut. This gut has markers to distinguish stem cells from enteroblasts and enterocytes. And here's a movie of a gut after the animal's been fed the toxin bleomycin. Bleomycin damages mid-gut enterocytes and induces an injury response. And you can see that this gut on the right doesn't look very happy. The cells are disorganized, they're moving around a lot, and there's a higher proportion of stem cells in enteroblasts here. So to analyze these movies, Aaron recognizes each stem cell in enteroblast and tracks it in 3D space over time. What this gives us is an, a highly granular view of cell life cycle kinetics when the organ changes state and when we go from a healthy organ to an injured organ. 
Now we've known for a while that injury causes widespread killing of enterocytes and that these dying enterocytes trigger faster stem cell divisions. And intuitively, this makes a lot of sense because an injured organ is as a desperate need for new cells. So you want to divide faster. Aaron here asked a simple question, but one that I think is equally important. What happens to the daughters of these stem cell divisions? Are they also dividing faster? This would make sense because faster differentiation would then get you to your desired end product of having new enterocytes faster. And it would also avoid a kinetic bottleneck of the sort that you see on the San Francisco Bay Bridge every weekday morning, where some of you have probably experienced this yourself, metering lights control the rate at which cars can progress onto the bridge span. And this rate is fixed regardless of how many cars pile up here. Aaron decided to look at enteroblast differentiation through the lens of notch. Like many tissues in development and maturity, notch in the flygut controls a key cell fate decision, the decision to become an enteroblast. Stem cells and new daughters express notch, but have essentially negligible levels of notch activity. But when notch gets activated in one of these cells, it drives it to become an enteroblast. Notch peaks in this enteroblast state and then is downregulated as the enteroblast matures into an enterocyte. Aaron wanted to measure the kinetics of this fate determining notch activity live. To do this, she used a new tool developed by Lee Hood and Norbert Paramount, the trans timer. Trans timer is a UAS construct with a bisestronic cassette that contains a fast folding, fast degrading GFP and a slow folding, slow degrading RFP. Aaron combines this with a GAL4 driven by a notch response element or NRE. So when notch gets activated during enteroblast differentiation, notch would bind the NRE and turn on expression of the trans timer. And we'd expect that one of these activation events would look something like this, where the GFP intensity, since GFP is fast folding, would rise up before the slow folding RFP intensity. Then when this enteroblast matures into an enterocyte, it turns off notch and we extinguish expression of the trans timer we'd expect one of these events to look like this, where the GFP intensity would fall faster since this is fast degrading, followed by a loss of RFP intensity. So this is what it should look like in theory, but what actually happens in real life? Here, Aaron's using window mount imaging to look at trans timer expression in knocked activated cells in healthy and injured mint guts. And what you can immediately see is that in these notch activated cells, there are different levels of red and green fluorescence, which suggests that the cells are at different states of enteroblast differentiation. Now, if we zoom in on single cells like this one here, we can find examples that go through a complete notch on off cycle in a single movie with a staggered rise and fall of GFP and RFP. And it's happening here in this video, but it might be easier to see here in these frame grabs. GFP comes up, followed by RFP, and then GFP goes down, again, followed by RFP. Aaron measures the fluorescence in single cells at each time point. And the plots that she gets from this then show us the real-time kinetics of notch activation and deactivation as cells differentiate. What's really satisfying is how closely this resembles what we might expect in theory. But what I haven't told you is that this cell comes from an injured gut. Erin could find lots of examples of these notch on off cells in her movies of injured guts, but she was hard pressed to find them in her movies of healthy guts. And instead, what was much more common in healthy guts was to see cells that just turn notch on, just are slowly turning notch off, or 
kind of just stay the same. And to drive this point home, I want to emphasize here that this is a composite of four different cells I've put together, four 20-hour time courses that I need to get this on-off cycle that we can get from one cell with one 20-hour time course in an injured gut. In fact, injured guts have more than twice as many of these notch on-off cells, whereas healthy guts have more notch on, on only cells or notch off only cells. So it really seems like kinetics of notch signaling are happening faster in injury. Erin wanted to explicitly measure this difference. So she went to her single cell traces, found the parts of the traces where notch was being activated and measured the slopes. When we look at plots of these slopes, we find that there is indeed a significantly faster rate of notch on in injured guts. She then does the thing, same thing with notch off, goes to her single cell traces and measures the slopes where fluorescence is decreasing. And when she makes these plots, you can see that again, rates of notch off are also significantly faster. So, Notch kinetics are happening faster in injured guts. What could this mechanism be? Well, to start to explore this, we turn to the notch ligand delta. Like notch, delta is expressed on the surface of stem cells and new daughters. And as a brief and extremely simplified primer, when notch on one cell binds delta on another cell, this activates notch and this not only turns on enteroblast fate determinants, but it also turns off delta. The upshot of this is as an enteroblast differentiates, there's an inverse relationship between delta and notch. In early differentiation, notch is low and delta is high. And later in differentiation, notch is high and delta is off. Miriam Sun quantified this inverse relationship in fixed guts. First, she identified the delta expressing cells by staining the guts with a delta antibody. She then measured single cell levels of notch activity using a sensitive notch GFP reporter. As we expect, most delta positive cells in healthy guts have extremely low levels of notch. And here, the sparseness of this transitional population with intermediate notch implies that when notch gets activated in healthy guts, delta shuts off very fast. Miriam then did the same experiment in injured guts. And here, she finds a different story. In injured guts, there are some delta positive cells that have low notch, like in healthy guts, but most of the delta positive cells actually have intermediate or even high notch. This is a really striking result because it implies that when notch gets activated in these injured guts, delta is not being silenced the way that it normally would. And in data I won't show, we have a similar result using a split GAL4 system to recognize the cells that have both activated delta, activated notch and delta expression. So we think this gives us a clue as to why notch is getting activated faster. When an enteroblast differentiates in a healthy gut, notch is low, delta is high, and then this switches so that notch becomes high and delta becomes low. But when an enteroblast differentiates in an injured gut, here, notch becomes high and delta stays high. This persistence of delta expression, we think can have important implications at the scale of the whole tissue. Because if you're a cell and you have notch receptor, then you're gonna have a lot more opportunities to interact with cells with delta ligand in an injured gut compared to a healthy gut. And we think that this higher level of delta could help explain why single cells are able to activate notch at a faster rate. So in the last part of my talk, I want to turn to the upstream injury signals that are underlying these changes in delta and notch. Like in 
many tissues in flies and vertebrates. In the fly gut, a key injury response pathway is JAK-STAT. Here in these fixed images, you can see how a STAT GFP reporter lights up stem cells and enteroblasts in injury. We know this is because damaged enterocytes secrete JAK-STAT ligands called unpaired. These unpaired activate JAK-STAT in stem cells, driving the faster stem cell divisions I told you about earlier. But unpaired also activate JAK-STAT in enteroblasts. So this raises the possibility that it's injury-induced JAK-STAT that's speeding up notch activation. To look at this explicitly, we expressed an activated allele of JAK in stem cells and enteroblasts. And then we asked, what happens to delta notch without injury? Looking first at delta staining in fixed guts, we find that activation of JAK-STAT is sufficient to delay the loss of delta in notch activated cells. So this looks very much like what we see in an injury state. So we went on then to look at notch kinetics live. Here are the movies I showed you earlier. This is our controlled genotype in a healthy state or an injured state. And here's a movie of an uninjured gut where now the stem cells in enteroblasts have ectopic JAK-STAT activation. Aaron measured single cell rates of notch kinetics in these movies. And excitingly, she found that activated JAK-STAT is sufficient to both increase rates of notch on and increase rates of notch off without any external damage. So, we're starting to get a picture of how cell life cycle dynamics change in order to enable injury repair. When the mid gut is healthy, it's like a sunny day. Life is good. So stem cells divide slowly and daughter cells take their sweet time to differentiate. But when injury strikes, now the organ needs an all hands on deck emergency response. Stem cells divide faster. And I showed you that daughter cells differentiate faster as well. We think this is because injury-induced JAK-STAT accelerates notch dynamics, perhaps by slowing down the silencing of delta in notch-activated cells. Now, to me, what's really cool about this model is that stem cells and differentiating cells are responding to the same injury-induced signal. This is an elegant solution to the problem of how you keep cell life cycles in sync, because using the same signal to speed up two successive stages of the life cycle would coordinate it so that repair can be efficient at the tissue scale. And I wanna close with perhaps a more philosophical question, which is that if a cell can differentiate fast, if it has the capability to mature quickly, if signaling networks have the capability to signal faster, why would they want to differentiate slow? I mean, faster is better, right? Well, I'll speculate <laughs> that there may be a trade-off here between speed and quality. And this is illustrated in this clip from one of my favorite old TV shows, I Love Lucy, where Lucy and Ethel are wrapping chocolates in the chocolate factory. And as the rate of production line goes up, the quality of the wrapping goes down. So I'll end with a question, which is, when enterocytes differentiate fast, what do they give up? And I'll close with again acknowledging the fantastic graduate student, Aaron Sanders, who really drove this project. I'm grateful to get to work with this amazing crew of folks every day. Some of you are out there right now. You guys are awesome. The fly community is always so incredibly generous with sharing stocks. And we're grateful for funding from these sources. Thank you.
Okay, that was beautiful, Lucy. We're gonna start with a question from the chat. All right, uh, beautiful work. This is a technical question. Do you feed the flies with uh, bleomycin beforehand or simultaneously while you make the movie? And for how long are the flies exposed to the treatment? The answer is uh, both. So in the movies that I showed today, um, bleomycin was fed to the flies. Um, the shortest one was, uh, uh, in the movie that I actually showed, um, bleomycin was fed two hours before imaging started. And it's also um, fed to the flies as they're being imaged. What's more typical for the measurements that we do though, is to feed them with bleomycin for, for two days. Okay, Erica. Lucy, that was awesome. Um, Thank you. My favorite pathway, Jack Stat. Do you yeah. know? <laughs> do you know? Do you know uh, what Stat is doing to delta levels? I mean, uh, it's downstream of Stat, I presume. Yeah, it's a transcriptional change, something like that. We do think there's a transcriptional change. I mean, at, at least a transcriptional change contributes, and the reason is that we get this same persistence of delta expression. Um, we see that using um, split a split gal four system that depends on delta expression to see the label. So at least part of the answer is at the transcriptional level. Thank you. Okay, one over here and then over here. Hi, uh, Ed Ginniger. So when you change notch activity, you're also going to locally change cell adhesion through notch dependent regulation of ABLE and RAT. So since you can look at single cell resolution, have you looked at the adhesion of these cells to see if that is altered and if the, the time course is altered? Uh, in, in, uh, for example, in the Jack Statton version, we don't have the, the damage to as a compounder. Right, great question. We have tracked the single cells in space and compared that to um, their kinetic to notch activation. We haven't done a complete quantitative analysis, but subjectively speaking, it's all over the board. Um, cells can be not activated or not. They can be moving around before or after. Um, they can come together with, with other cells um, as they're moving around. So there isn't a, a, clear, a clearly obvious pattern that we see. Thank you. A great talk, Lucy. Um, Thank you. So, so with the slow, uh, with the fast um, disappearance of delta, do you think that's the mechanism for the notch inactivity deactivation that you see in the normal tissue? And if so, then the lingering. How do you explain the faster notch inactivation in the presence of lingering delta? And, and uh, can I just ask a real small question too? Please. So your enterocyte seems fatter than normal. And I'm wondering if there's a reason for that. Yeah, let me, let me take the second question first. Um, I think the enterocytes may well be fatter than normal in injury and the, the enteroblasts as well. Um, my, my speculation, I'm not, I'm not sure if my lab members would agree, but my speculation is in damage. Uh, the epithelium needs to spread out thinner to cover the gaps of the dying cells. Um, and I'm sorry, please remind me about The first notch. question is, how do you uh, quickly inactivate notch in the presence of lingering delta in the injured state? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I, I don't know the, the answer directly. Um, I'll speculate that that's probably a delta independent mechanism sure, since yeah since Delta is staying on. We don't know how notch gets inactivated though, um, even during control differentiation. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Celeste, and then a question from the chat. Okay. I, I noticed, or at least I thought I saw that when you overexpressed Jack stat in uninjured guts, the response of Delta wasn't quite as robust as when you have a really injured gut. Is it possible that enterocytes that are healthy are sending a signal back to the stem cells to delay differentiation or delay division, or somehow there's another signal out there that's making the lazy, slow process happen. <laughs> yeah, Celeste, that is, um, uh, that is a very um, astute observation. Um, and um, I see that someone caught that. I wondered if anyone would. Um, you're right that the, the effect, even the rates of notch um, get accelerated even more 
than in injured guts when we express the activated JAXA. In fact, our effect on Delta is not as pronounced. We think there are other signals involved. Um, EGFs, which are also upregulated in injury, are our favorite candidate right now, and love to look at that. So uh, Lucy, does, does the window mount technique work if the mid gut, hind gut junction is folded away from the cuticle? Ah, no. Um, unfortunately, our window mount, the way we do it, um, uh, exposes a particular region of the gut. Um, the aficionados will know that it's uh, uh, R4AB region um, and not the mid gut, hind gut junction. Whether it could be modified to do that is something I don't know. Okay, next to it, the microphone. Hi, beautiful talk Thank and you. amazing live imaging. Um, I was wondering if the window mounting technique, do you think it could be modified to fit other tissues or is the mid gut in a convenient spot for that? Yeah, so we actually, um, I'll say uh, new students in the lab when they're learning the technique, uh, their windows tend to be a little bigger and we can often catch uh, sides of the ovary, parts oh, of ovaries. Amazing, see, what about- See the ovarial spinning. I was wondering about the testis. Ah, um, we always work with females. So actually I, I can't answer that question. Great, thank you. Thank you. I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on or interest in uh, the microbiome of these flies and how it might be affected by either your model or how it might directly affect some of these signaling pathways? Yeah, absolutely. The gut microbiome is really like, the other partner in all of this, um, we've just started to look at it with live imaging. Thanks. So then, um, Lucy, then would you expect to see this sort of interaction with other stressors that induce jack stat, like high fat diets and those sorts of <laughs> high fat diet? That's really interesting. Other kinds of injury, yes. Um, I I would be. Uh, that's interesting. I, I haven't looked at that. I haven't thought about that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. If it's just in general. Very quickly. Okay. Hi, I'm Chi, and I'm from Alan Sprantley lab. Hi. Lab. And uh, I'm a mouse guy. So, and <laughs> I mean, this, this question may be very stupid. So, do you know the shading of the cake? Imagine, or imagine could affect the result? Uh, my question is, you know, you did some, you know, uh, uh, surgery on the fly, and you do the imaging. Even the even the fly is still alive. You cut my hand up, I still alive. And uh, could that affect, you know, the tissue, the type, the differentiation, the division? Got it. So I I think you're asking whether um, the imaging protocol itself is perhaps stressing yes, the flies right. and if, if this explains our result. I'm, I'm sure that the flies are sure, it does create, I mean, being, yeah, you're right, being on a confocal stage with lasers shining at you every minute is gonna be a stressful yeah. experience. Um, and it's a common baseline to, to all of our experiments. Um, so how it would compare in a, a fly just in the vial, um, I'm not sure. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's all thank Lucy again. Thank you. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Michelle Bland from the University of Virginia. And Michelle's going to talk to us about regulating host phospholipid metabolism to fight infection. Michelle. Uh, thank you. It is such an absolute honor to be here, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's my pleasure today to talk to you guys about the burgeoning field of immunometabolism. And I wanted to start off by talking about how immune responses across the animal kingdom have been shown to alter metabolism. On the left, we see an Arctic ptarmigan. These birds reduce the activity of their innate immune signaling pathways in the winter time to conserve energy, to allow them to have better thermoregulation. In a cellular example from mammals, 
your cells that are responding to the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines to produce antibodies, these plasma cells massively indu induce protein synthesis and also expand the ER by increasing phospholipid metabolism to allow for that secretory response to occur. Closer to home in Drosophila, in adult flies, enterocytes in the gut, um, in infected animals, divert NADPH from the process of making fatty acids to ROS production to kill microbes, to kill the pathogenic microbes. And that decreases triglyceride levels. And then in a similar ma manner, um, triglyceride levels are depleted in the adult fat body in flies that are infected with the intracellular parasite tubulinosema radis benensis. This bug consumes the fatty acid precursor phosphatidic acid at the expense of triglyceride storage by the host. I'm gonna to talk to you today about another way in which infection and innate immune signaling reduce triglyceride storage. And I'm gonna focus on the toll signaling pathway, which is one of the key signaling pathways that we work on in my lab. So shown here on the left is a schematic of the toll signaling pathway. You know, this is one of the crowning achievements, one of the many crowning achievements of Drosophila biology, worked out by many, many labs over the course of several decades. Infection with gram-positive bacteria or fungi activates a protease cascade, leading to production of a mature ligand spetzel for the dimeric toll receptors in cells such as um, hemocytes and fat body. This leads to the activation of an intracellular MIDE88 tube peli cactus diff signaling cascade, ending up with a transcription factor diff and NF kappa B family member, translocating to the nucleus and driving expression of antimicrobial peptides. These amps are translated, enter the secretory pathway through the ER, transit through the Golgi and are secreted in secretory vessel, vesicles um, where they are um, secreted into hemolymph and in hemolymph, they accumulate in really high quantities to kill pathogenic microbes by puncturing their membranes. And so the importance of this uh, signaling pathway to, and the IMD pathway, which is the sister pathway that I'm not gonna talk about today, to the protection of the host is evident by mutations in the pathway that sensitize animals to infections. I showed you a couple of examples from adult fruit flies, but today I'm gonna to talk about the larval fruit fly. So just to acquaint everyone with what we're talking about, I'm gonna be speaking about the larval fat body. During an, a, a humoral immune response, the larval fat body is the source of most of the circulating antimicrobial peptides. This is a really interesting organ to think about in terms of interactions between immunity and metabolism because not only do fat body cells synthesize and secrete antimicrobial peptides in response to infection and toll and IMD signaling, but they also store nutrients for the animal in the forms of triglycerides and glycogen. And thirdly, fat body cells regulate whole animal growth and metabolism through a variety of secreted factors. Work in my lab over the last several years has led to our um, understanding of how toll signaling impacts growth and metabolism. So for example, we found that toll signaling blocks insulin signaling cell autonomously in fat body cells between the level of PA3 kinase and AKT by inhibiting AKT phosphorylation. We also have shown that toll signaling in the larval fat body reduces growth of the whole animal. And we found that this is due to a decrease in the production of the insulin-like peptide DILP6, which we find is decreased by infection um, at the transcript level, but is also decreased in circulation. Um, and rescuing DILP6 rescues growth in these animals. But what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is this third phenotype on the slide. We've known about this for many, many years. And in fact, Justin D'Angelo worked on this a long time ago. <laughs> and what we have, what we have appreciated is that if you activate toll signaling in the larval fat body, you reduce triglyceride storage by about 50%. And we wanted to understand finally why this was occurring. So this was the project of my very first graduate student, Brittany Martinez. Here she is um, celebrating the award of her PhD. Her question was, how does innate immune signaling regulate lipid metabolism? And the hypothesis that she set out with to test is that toll signaling inhibits lipid storage to divert cellular energy toward the process of fighting infection. 
Okay, so again, to remind you, what she's investigating is this mechanism for a decrease in triglyceride storage. She started out by asking whether the precursors for triglycerides or the enzymes that synthesize fatty acids were lacking in flies that had active toll signaling. So she, we measured trehalose and glucose, the circulating sugars in Drosophila in hemolymph. And we found that there was in fact no difference in circulating trehalose or glucose in animals that are expressing TOL10B, a constitutively active TOL receptor. Those um, symbols, those are the pink symbols versus animals expressing GFP control in larval fat body. Brittany also measured expression of enzymes that carry out the first steps in fatty acid synthesis, ATP citrate lyase, acetyl-CoA carboxylase, and fatty acid synthase. These enzymes were not reduced by toll signaling, and if anything, they were increased by about 50 to 75% in animals with active toll signaling. And so we reasoned that probably fatty acid production, given the fact that the precursors are present, the enzymes are being expressed, that might be, um, that might persist in animals with active toll signaling. So what I'm gonna tell you about is how we dove down further into the pathway, but first I want to just take a moment to talk about the two methods that we use to activate the toll signaling pathway. The first is something that you've already seen. We use the GAL4 UAS system to drive expression of a constitutively active toll receptor, TOL10B, that carries a mutation at a juxta membrane site that leads to constitutive uh, receptor dimerization in the absence of ligand. When we drive this using the R4 GAL4 larval fat body driver, we see a robust induction of a target gene of the toll pathway, drosomycin. The other method that we use to activate the toll pathway is a physiological method. We puncture larvae with tungsten needles and then allow Enterococcus faecalis, a gram positive bacteria, to enter through the wound. What you can see shown here in the graph on the bottom showing hours post-infection is that we see a robust induction of drosomycin in the animals that were infected with a peak at 24 hours and that this become, starts to come down at 36 hours. Here, the black bars are uninfected larvae, the green bars are larvae infected with enterococcus faecalis. So using these two methods of activating toll signaling, Brittany looked further down in the signaling pathway. So I've already talked to you about the enzymes, ATP citrate lyase, ACC, and FAS. Brittany looked at the enzyme that carries out the very final step in synthesizing a triglyceride, the diacylglycerol transferase homolog uh, midway. And what she found is that there's a 50% reduction in midway transcript levels in animals with genetically activated toll signaling, and that this enzyme is rapidly and strongly um, inhibited by infection. So we see decreased levels of midway that persist through the first 24 hours of infection compared with uninfected animals. So we thought we were done. We thought that this, this solved the problem. And the next step was just to do a genetic rescue experiment and we would call it a day. And we tried many, many, many ways to try to uh, rescue triglycerides by re-expressing midway. And in fact, we got to the point where we drove expression of midway with the enzyme that precedes it in the pathway, lipin, to make sure that there was a sufficient delivery of the precursor to the pathway. And in fact, we could only ever achieve a partial rescue. This is consistent with the idea that it's not just levels of these enzymes that are important for driving triglyceride storage. Perhaps there's a post-translational modification or a subcellular localization of either of these two enzymes that's important for the regulation by toll signaling. But we thought that this was also consistent with the possibility that toll signaling might be diverting fatty acids to another metabolic pathway. So what other metabolic pathways could be used? Cells make fatty acids for a variety of purposes. Of course, I've been talking to you about triglycerides. The fatty acids here, are, the purpose is energy storage. There are some interesting post-translational modifications and signaling roles of fatty acids, but really the other major um, fate of fatty acids in cells is phospholipids, um, the molecules that form lipid bilayers. So Brittany inquired whether phospholipid synthesis might be affected by toll signaling. So what I'm showing you here is a little bit of biochemistry. Uh, we've been looking at the pathway on the left, the triglyceride synthesis pathway. The precursor DAG in this pathway, diacylglycerol, 
is also used in the phospholipid synthesis pathway, where ethanolamine or choline are ultimately attached to fatty acids to form phosphatidylethanolamine and phosphatidylcholine, components of membrane bilayers. Brittany looked at expression of enzymes in these pathways using RTQPCR and Western blotting in both animals that were infected with Enterococcus faecalis and animals with active TUL signaling induced by R4, GAL4 driving TUL 10 b What she found is that there's induction of um, the enzyme easily shocked or EAS, which encodes an ethanol ethanolamine kinase and CG7149, which I'm not showing you here in terms of data that carries out the final step in making phosphatidylethanolamine. We found elevated transcript levels of easily shocked and in Western blotting, we observed a noticeable increase in, Western, in easily shocked protein in fat bodies that had active toll signaling. In fat bodies dissected from infected animals, we find a trend for easily shocked to increase in expression in the later points after infection. The other pathway generates phosphatidylcholine. Brittany found elevated levels of CG2201, the choline kinase homolog. I'm not going to show you that data but she also found elevated levels of PCYT1, the enzyme that encodes the next step in the pathway. This was true at the transcript level in fat bodies with active toll signaling induced genetically and at the level of protein. Again, Western blots from dissected fat bodies. And when we dissected fat bodies from animals infected with Enterococcus faecalis, we found elevated levels of PCYT1 that uh, occurred for the first 18 hours of infection and the re return to normal. In agreement with an increase in these enzymes that produce phospholipids, when we carried out mass spectrometry analysis of dissected fat bodies that were expressing GFP shown in black or GFP or Tolten B shown in purple, we found elevated levels of the major species of both phosphatidylethanolamine shown here on the left and phosphatidylcholine shown on the right. So toll signaling is inducing the enzymes that synthesize phospholipids and it's also leading to an increase in the levels of phospholipids in cells. So our next question of course was, well, what purpose do increased phospholipid levels serve in fat body cells with active toll signaling? And we considered what is going on in a cell that is responding to infection or that has an active toll signaling pathway. A few years ago, we carried out RNA sequencing analysis of fat bodies where we had turned the toll 10 b um, transgene on for just 12 hours. And not surprisingly, and entirely expected, what we found is a massive induction of the genes that encode antimicrobial peptides. 17 of the 37 genes encoding antimicrobial peptides were induced four to 400 times fold in animals that express toll 10 b compared with uh, controls. And if you just plot out essentially the percent of toll 10 b induced AMP transcripts, what you find is that some of these AMPs account, account for, individual AMPs can account for about 10 to 30% of the induction of um, the pathway. And if we take one of these, drosomycin, which you've heard about, drosomycin accounts for 10% of the induced AMP um, transcriptome. Drosomycin levels have been estimated to circulate in hemolymph um, at around one to 100 micromolar. This vastly exceeds the IC50 for fungicidal killing, which is around one to two micromolar. And so even at 10 micromolar um, drosomycin, you're talking about millions upon millions of individual molecules. So the secretory demands of mounting an immune response are truly astonishing. So of course we thought about the endoplasmic reticulum and we carried out a transmission electron microscopy to determine whether this structure was noticeably altered when we turned on the toll pathway. And here we're doing so genetically using toll 10 b So what you're looking at on this slide are two electron micrographs. On the left is an electron micrograph from an animal that expressed GFP in fat body. You can see lipid droplets, of course. And I'm pointing out the ER with this, these yellow arrows. On the right, is a electron micrograph from a fat body that expressed toll 10 b Of course, we see lipid droplets, we see large pools of glycogen, but we also see an expanded and dilated endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, Brittany carried out stereology analysis 
And what she found is that the, uh, there was a 40% increase in the relative volume of the ER in animals that had active toll signaling and fat body compared with controls. So this increase in ER morphogenesis, this ER expansion, next led us to ask whether hallmarks of ER stress might be induced when we turn on the toll signaling pathway. We looked at PERC, um, ATF6, and XBP1. And what we found is that there was an induction of the active form of XBP1. Let me take one step back and explain to you the unfolded protein response. In cells that are undergoing active and large amounts of secretion, or that have a, are dealing with a lot of unfolded proteins, the ER sends a signal to the cell that more help is needed. And one of these pathways is the, X, is the IRE1 XBP1 pathway. IRE1 cleaves the, the immature XBP1 transcript, um, splices out this intervening intron, and this yields a mature spliced XBP1S. Translation of this transcript yields a transcription factor that has many targets, including um, protein folding chaperones, components of the secretory machinery, et cetera. We found elevated levels of spliced XBP1 in animals with active toll signaling as measured by RTQPCR, shown on here on the left. And this transcript was induced early and throughout the active immune response in response to infection. So this led us to consider how non-canonical targets, such as phospholipid synthesizing enzymes, might be induced in response to infection. And we thought about a couple of different pathways, perhaps a linear pathway in which toll signaling induced the expression of antimicrobial peptides, this onslaught of uh, transcripts and um, in oncoming peptides into the secretory machinery led to ER stress. This then in turn leads to the induction of enzymes like PCYT1 and easily shocked that allow for ER expansion by the production of membrane, membrane phospholipids. And then that ER expansion in turn might promote antimicrobial peptide secretion and leading, lead to microbe killing. On the other hand, perhaps toll signaling activates both antimicrobial peptide synthesis and phospholipid synthesis in parallel in an anticipatory manner. So we reasoned that we could maybe test these hypotheses by removing a large chunk of the secretory load that uh, fat bodies with active toll signaling are experienced. So we deleted antimicrobial peptide genes. The prediction if the pathway is linear is that the deletion of the antimicrobial peptide genes should interfere with the production or the induction of PCYT1 and easily shocked. The way that we did this was we used two mutations. One is this deletion, bomanin delta 55C, that deletes 10 bomanin genes that are in a cluster on the second chromosome. And the other is the drosomycin delta 717 mutation. We validated that these mutations indeed deleted the genes that they were purported to delete. And so then we asked our question. And lo and behold, we found that when we induced toll signaling in animals that carried a deletion um, of the bomanin cluster and drosomycin, that in contrast to wild type, animals with wild type AMPs, where we see induction of both PCYT1 and easily shocked, the deletion of AMPs actually blunted the induction of these two phospholipid synthesizing enzymes. So this fit with our linear model of toll signaling driving phospholipid synthesis. So naturally, what we wanted to do was go one step up and look at ER stress. Here we got a big surprise. Deletion of these AMPs had no effect on the induction of XBP1 or one of its target genes, BIP, by toll signaling. So in fact, if anything, we see slightly higher induction of XBP1 and BIP um, when we turn on the toll signaling pathway. So this actually contradicted this really nice linear model that we've set up here. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what we think might be going on here, but the answer is that we don't really know for sure. But we think that there might be a time dependence for regulating phospholipid synthesis in response to infection. So what I've shown you is the uh, response, the, the effects of these deletions on a sustained chronic um, production or activation of the toll signaling pathway. And what we've found is that when we sustain activity of toll signaling, that high AMP levels 
are necessary to induce PCYT1 and easily shocked, but that these that we still find elevated XPP1 and ER stress even in the absence of AMPs. And this tells us that, X, that ER stress is likely not sufficient to induce PCYT1 and easily shocked. What we haven't done yet is tested the necessity of these antimicrobial peptides entering the secretory time point or secretory pathway during the induction phase of either toll signaling or infection. We think, however, that our data might suggest an anticipatory role. And that's because when we line these graphs up and we look at drosomycin, XBP1 in the middle and PCYT1 on the bottom, we find that XBP1 and PCYT1 peak well before the peak of the induction of drosomycin. So we have this rather complicated model that we're working on where we think that perhaps the early phase of, in, of making phospholipid synthesizing enzymes in response to tool signaling, the induction phase might be anticipatory where the, the pathways operate in parallel. But as um, prolonged signaling goes on, for example, in an animal that's expressing Tolton B or perhaps an animal that's having difficulty clearing an infection, uh, the sustaining the phospholipid enzymes requires feedback, perhaps from AMP entry into the secretory pathway. So this is still an area of investigation. So finally, I'd like to wrap up the talk by talking to you about the consequences of these lipid metabolic switches for animals that have toll signaling um, or are infected. What are the consequences of reducing triglyceride storage and elevating phospholipid synthesis in response to toll signaling? This is the phenotype that we started with. Toll signaling lowers triglyceride storage in the larval fat body. Larval triglycerides have two major fates. One fate is that they're used to power metamorphosis through the breakdown of these enzymes by beta oxidation. The other major fate is that these triglycerides and the fatty acids that are stored in them can be converted to hydrocarbons and then also very long chain fatty acids that are used to waterproof the adult cuticle. We investigated the latter phenotype and we investigated this by starving larvae with or without water. As shown on the left, when we starve larvae and make sure they, or sorry, adult flies, I misspoke. When we starve adult flies that had expressed GFP in the black line or Tolton B in the purple line throughout the larval stage, and we give them plenty of water we see absolutely no difference in the death rates of these flies. In contrast, when we starve animals, but also expose them to the second stressor of desiccation, so starving them in the absence of water, what we find is a really early death caused by active toll signaling consistent with decreased triglyceride storage in the larval state, not providing sufficient precursors to waterproof the cuticle. Now I'm gonna tell you about two methods that we use to test the role of elevated phospholipid synthesis in the animal's ability to fight infection. And I'm gonna look at two immune phenotypes. One is the production and secretion of antimicrobial peptides. And the second is bacterial killing. So to test antimicrobial secretion, we use the genetic approach. We drove Tolton B in the fat body under control of R4-GAL4 with or without simultaneous knockdown of two enzymes, PCYT1 and easily shocked. And then we monitored secretion of adrosomycin GFP fusion protein into hemolymph. Then we, so we did Western blots on dissected fat bodies and Western blots on hemolymph. And what we find is that if we just look at the drosomycin GFP that's in the fat body, that this is of course induced by toll signaling. And that would actually, there are lower levels of the drosomycin GFP when we knock down these two phospholipid en synthesis enzymes. Elevated levels of PCYT1 and easily shocked also accompany um, toll signaling as expected, and they're completely blocked by these transgenes th that knock down these enzymes. When we looked in the hemolymph, we found that in three or four cases, we have lower levels of drosomycin GFP in hemolymph. So these data suggest that these enzymes act in fat body to promote antimicrobial peptide secretion. But really the most important question is, what does it, does it matter for an animal that's infected? So to test this, we infected larvae with Enterococcus faecalis and the larvae that we infected either expressed RFP and GFP control transgenes in fat body. Those are shown in gray in the graphs on the right, 
or they had knockdown of both PCYT1 and easily shocked as shown in blue. We took whole larvae, we isolated RNA, and we did RTQPCR to measure drosomycin or the 16S ribosomal RNA for enterococcus faecalis. And what we found is if we look at 16S RNA, that at late time points following infection, animals with knockdown of PCYT1 and easily shocked have elevated bacterial burden compared with controls. This also correlates with a persistence of drosomycin expression in these animals at late time points compared with controls. So these data indicate to us that these enzymes are playing important roles in the fat body that facilitate uh, clearance of bacteria during infection. So our, our model show, suggests that the toll signaling pathway is targeting de novo lipogenesis to support immune function. We believe that toll signaling induces expression of enzymes like PCYT1 and easily shocked to synthesize phospholipids. We think these phospholipids are being used, used to build the ER and that they support immune function. Some key outstanding questions from their work are how does the toll pathway actually regulate expression of midway PCYT1 and easily shock non-canonical targets? Is DIF required for their expression? Does toll signaling employ, employ post-transcriptional mechanisms to regulate lipid metabolism? And do ER morphology and phospholipid levels revert to normal after an infection is resolved? So these are areas of active investigation. And I wanted to finally thank again, Brittany Martinez who carried out most of this work and she was assisted by an undergraduate at the, in the lab, Rosalie Hoyle. And I wanted to thank the people that are in the lab now who make the lab a great place to work. Uh, a few of my UVA fly colleagues who I interact with regularly and get great advice from and then the community for reagents. Thank you. We're gonna start with a virtual question. So uh, great talk. Have you considered whether there might also be phospholipid hydrolysis into immunomodulatory lipid mediators in response to toll signaling or infection? This is a great question. We have considered it, but we have not done anything to address it yet. And I think that, you know, but one thing that would be interesting to determine is uh, using mass spec perhaps on hemolymph to look for those, those kinds of molecules, yeah. Okay, we're going to do a question from the speaker's left and a question from the speaker's right. Hi, that was a great talk. Uh, I'm curious if you've looked at ER morphology in uh, PCY80 and EAS knockdown animals in the fat body to see if you could be seeing secondary effects of secretory pathway uh, malfunction. You know. That we would love to do that. Um, we, we did not get to that uh, for this particular set of experiments. It is on the list of things to do. Yeah. I, I assume the same thing also holds for total loss of function mutants where- Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's likely that PCYT1 and easily shocked deletion or knockdown may have themselves interesting effects on ER because, for example, if you knock those two enzymes down, you see induction of, of XBP1 splicing as well as some of its target genes. So it looks like it, it induces ER stress on its own. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Great stuff. So um, you mentioned beta oxidation briefly. So do you know if any of the uh, if there's any diversion into the beta oxidation in the mitochondria or maybe for peroxide production? We looked quite a bit at lipolysis, which doesn't quite get to your question, but we really considered the fact that uh, like lipolysis of the triglycerides might be underlying the decrease in triglyceride storage. And we tried, you know, nine different ways to, to affect that pathway, including looking at um, paroxysomal uh, types of lipid degradation, and we never could find um, rescues of phenotypes. So, you know, obviously that's, it's a negative result, but we don't really think that's a major player. Okay, I'm sorry that we're out of time and we need to move on, but one more round of applause for Michelle. Right. Thank you very much, Michelle. And our next speaker is Daniel Matute, and he will tell us about the genetic basis of hybrid and viability. Let's see. 
Refresh. There you are. Well, while this is loading, I wanna really thank the, the committee that actually allow me to be here because this feels good to be here. Uh, I really cannot emphasize uh, what this community means um, and how important the fly meeting has been for, for the folks that actually work on hybrid biology, especially in Drosophila, obviously. For the last 15 years, uh, myself and then my group have been focused on trying to understand what are the genetic underpinnings of those defects that actually only happen in hybrids. And this is an important question for evolutionary biology because to some extent, it really addresses what are the genetic changes that actually explain biodiversity at large. Depending on what kind of hybrids you study and what is the genetic distance between the parents of the hybrids, actually you can actually get different levels of information on how divergence in the genome occurs. For example, if you're actually studying a species that are very closely related, uh, and there is not many reproductive isolating mechanism that for the rest of the talk, I am gonna refer as RIMs. Um, well, in those cases, you're actually really studying a speciation as it proceeds. If there is only one barrier, like for example, behavior or a serenity that keeps the species apart, you're really trying to understand what is the first thing that actually is in place that keeps species from just exchanging genes. If you go further along, and for example, they study hybrid zones and species that are well formed but are still can interchange genes. In that case, you are actually really trying to understand what happens when they come into contact and how those species persist in nature. If you actually go even further and you try to understand what happens when species are really, really diverge, what actually you are trying to do is probably not so much speciation, not try to understand what are those genetic changes that have actually come into place when when that first split occur, because there is so much genetic change that has accumulated that at that point, the signature of the speciation is probably already erased. But what you actually can gather from that is how genomes evolve. And to me, this is an important question because it puts speciation in just as a sliver of time in the process of divergence at large, which is essentially something that is happening continuously. So for today, I'm gonna focus on what hap essentially what happens when you try to understand when you cross two species that are really, really diverged. My group actually does all these levels of divergence, but just to keep it tight today, I'm gonna try to, on, to essentially focus on what happens when you cross the species that are really divergent. And one of the phenomena that is quite interesting, at least in my view, is the phenomenon of hybrid incompatibilities. Because it just provides a very simple mecha genetic mechanism on how those defects that you observe in hybrids, such as hybrid viability or hybrid sterility, that are not present in the parents, actually come to be genetically in a hybrid. And the process is actually very simple. When you have two species that are divergent, you have genetic changes that are accumulating over time. And those different uh, alleles that get fixed in the different species might not talk well to each other in the hybrid when they encounter each other for the first time. And that those epistatic interactions that are negative might actually explain the phenom phenomenon as a striking as a sterility, behavioral defects, or in this case, in the case of today, inviability. And there is a profoundly rich literature on this, a very exquisite work that has been done trying to understand what are the genetic basis of hybrid sterility and inviability in Drosophila. The focus of this study has been the species uh, of the Simulus group and Drosophila melanogasters for many reasons. First, it were like we have all the generic armamentarium of Drosophila melanogaster, but also Drosophila simulans, which is listed here as SIM, was discovered that actually could hybridize with melanogaster in the 1920s by Alfred Sturvant and only produce hybrid females. This was a, a, a puzzle for genetics at that point. Where are the males? Where did the males go? And there has been extensive work that actually has pointed out to the precise genetic underpinnings that has left, that, ha that caused this hybrid viability of the males. And here I'm listing just some of the studies that actually have been done in Drosophila that have truly, truly go deep into the molecular biology of how these genetic interactions actually take place. If 
by any chance you're interested on this topic, I cannot recommend this literature enough because it really represents a variety of techniques and just approaches and is some of the most elegant, elegant genetics that I have ever read. Today, however, I felt that it would be appropriate just to go a little bit farther. And by a little bit farther, I mean 10 million years more, because why not? <laughs> In 2009, we were actually trying to do some genetic experiments, trying to crossing melanogaster with other species. And in particular, with a species that I have been working since 2006, a species endemic to the island of Sao Tome, that is of course of Cameroon, a volcanic island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Drosophila santomea is sister species to another species that is called Yakuba, that is only found on uh, continental Africa and its adjacent islands. They form a hybrid zone and it is very interesting biology, but curious minds inquire whether actually it could hybridize with other species in the Melanogaster group. And that's exactly what we did. And we found the same phenomenon that actually was reported in the 1920s. If you take Drosophila melanogaster females and cross them to Santomea males, what you obtain is only female progeny. And you can see here some of the features of those females. They are deeply malformed in the cuticle and the males are completely gone. So in the same way that in the 1920s, Sturevan wonder, and by no means I am comparing myself to Sturevan, but <laughs> just to be clear, I wonder where are the males? It turns out to be that the males are dead, very dead. <laughs> and to be clear, this is not a simple death. In the left, you have exa an example of a cuticle of a pure species, in this case, the parental Drosophila santomea. In, the, in this left, you have Drosophila santomea. And in the far left over there, you have a hybrid male of Drosophila melanogaster cross to santomea. It has a head, it has a thorax, and it has a telson. And it's missing the abdomen. And this is bad, really bad for a fly. You can tell why it really doesn't come, it doesn't really get to adulthood. So the next question that we were wondering was, is this phenomenon restricted to just this particular cross, just to Melanogaster and Santomea? So we did all the possible crosses in the Melanogaster species group. And here I'm just showing a reduction of the, of, of the potential crosses that actually you can do. And the only species that actually show the abdominal defect, that ablation uh, of, of, the, of these abdominal segments are those that actually are come from the Melanogaster simulans of Mauritian and Triad, uh, and Drosophila santomea males. Everything else doesn't show the ablation with the caveat, and I need to be precise here, that there are crosses that we just never managed to actually get going. Those crosses from Santomea females or from Yakuba females actually never really proceeded when you made them with Melanogaster. And we, I'm not exaggerating when I say that we tried millions of flies. It never worked. I tried them every six months, just <laughs> because. But the question that actually you might actually be wondering, and this is exactly where we went, we were a few years ago, was what is the genetic basis of such a striking defect? So that became our goal. Try to understand how to essentially a phenotype that is so dramatic as a fly missing a full section of the atom actually came, comes to be. And for this, we essentially just built on the rich literature that actually I had shown before. Because here, really, we stand in the shoulders of giants. And what we use was a technique developed by Kiyoshi Sawamura in, the 19, in, in about 1990, published for the first time in 19, 1993, that uses attached excess stocks and puts a small chunks of the y, X chromosome linked to the Y chromosome. Here, I need to tell you a particular detail that we discovered around that time, and is that when we cross melanogaster stocks that have an attached X, those X that are fused to each other, to Santomea, we actually rescue the males. The males actually survive, but the females die. Because essentially this, there is there's something toxic in that X chromosome from, Santo, from melanogaster. These men that we could produce males that actually have a Y chromosome from melanogaster and small chunks of the X chromosome from melanogaster as well. And we could tile the whole X chromosome to try to see essentially whether there was any defect at that point. And that's exactly what we did with the very, very important help of the Bloomington Stock Center, which I cannot really love enough. So we tiled the whole X chromosome. And what we found was several sections of the X chromosome that actually caused hybrid inviability and caused those hybrid males that otherwise would be viable to die. 
there are multiple ways to die. One of them is pupal lethality. That was a relatively rare phenomenon with only three, three sections of the X chromosome actually ca causing pupal lethality. There was nine regions that actually cause embryonic lethality. And that's what I was particularly interested in because there was this phenomenon from abdominal ablation. But of those nine, there was only one, only one that caused a abdominal ablation. There are multiple defects here, but only one that actually leads to abdominal ablation and was a section around cytochom cyt um, cytoband 3A. You can tell here that that's, again, it's not a healthy fly. Well, we kept adding duplications, this time not using only those that actually are in, linked to the Y chromosome, but also those that are linked to the third chromosome. We were able not to narrow it down, not only to 3A, but to 3A3. Of going further, we actually be, were able to narrow it down to giant, a single gene that is involved in the gap gene development of the fly. There are other approaches that we use here. We use deficiency mapping, we use duplication mapping, essentially just to find that giant is a responsible allele that actually causes this abdominal ablation. I need to be very clear here. And I am not saying that it's the only one that causes hybrid inviability in these hybrids. There are other nine that actually cause embryonic inviability, another three that actually cause pupal inviability, and there are all autosomal partners here. But at least we had one that we knew that was causing not only hybrid inviability, but by a particularly striking phenomenon, phenotypically speaking. We use other tools. We essentially use the DGRP to cross 200 lines of the DGRP to cross to Santomea and essentially find out whether there was variance within melanogaster that were associated with the penetrance of hybrid inviability and abdominal ablations. And indeed, we find that there is a region in the X chromosome that is associated with these two phenomena. And both of them actually contain the gene giant. There is more. Actually, giant expresses, it has two, posterior, two, two domains of expression. One of them is posterior in the uh, abdominal segments, A6 and A7, which are usually the ones that are missing in these hybrids, which contributes to the idea that giant is important for hybrid inviability in these hybrids. Cool story. But actually this represents a massive opportunity to try to understand how hybrid compatibilities evolve. Giant is one of the best study genes in development. It represents a fantastic opportunity not to only try to understand what is the genetic basis of the phenomenon, but how it actually takes place. And one of the opportunities that we have is that there has been absolutely fantastic work trying to understand the regulation of giant itself. This represents a clear hypothesis for us. Uh, well, at least it was clear at the time. <laughs> and it was, well, giant is a dynamic factor of development in Drosophila. Ergo, the regulation of giant must cause hybrid inviability. So what we did with the work with, in collaboration with Martin Kreiman and Wen Han Chang, that is finishing his PhD in Chicago, was to generate interspecific chimeras, was to generate the four type of combinations, essentially flies uh, that had a regulatory element of giant from melanogaster and a coding sequence from melanogaster, a regulatory element from Santomea and a coding region from melanogaster and so on and so forth. I'm getting lost, there is four, right? That are listed right there. There is an additional control and is that we actually put a, a P element, uh, we could excise it because he had a piggyback repeat. So we can actually control that actually the the vector didn't carry any rescuing cap capability. And the results of that experiment are shown here in this table. We, we, we put melanogaster coding sequence with melanogaster regulation in these hybrids, in the third chromosome, and that's an important technical detail because the expression in the third chromosome of giant has some quirks that I am happy to discuss afterwards, actually leads to a relative embryonic lethality that is, that is noticeable. As suspected, I mean, if the mapping was correct, this is exactly what we should observe. When we put the melanogaster coding sequence with the drive, with the cis regulatory element and essentially all the regulating elements of giant from Santomea, we see something very similar in terms of embryonic lethality there. The p-value on the far left is the comparison that actually that we did with the melanogaster, melanogaster chimera. When we put the melanogaster known coding, with the Santomea known coding, what we see is that the relative embryonic lethality decreases. 
essentially there is very little embryonic lethality. And if we actually have the Santomea and Santomea com combined elements, it is on the similar order. There is very little lethality there. What this is telling me is that my hypothesis was wildly wrong for two reasons. There, one of the expectations is that there was gonna be some, uh, some type of emergent property between the regulatory elements and the coding sequence. That's not what is happening. Also, the regulatory sequence of melanogaster really doesn't have an effect on hybrid viability. What matters here really is the coding sequence of melanogaster coding, the coding sequence of melanogaster giant. And that was a really big surprise for us. If we keep going, actually, one of the possibilities that actually we can address now is not only whether it is the cis regulatory element or the coding sequence, we could just go deeper, right? Again, the opportunity that is giant is really, really intriguing. So when we compare the sequences, and this is only possible because of the genome alignments that actually were generated by Bernard Kim, Aaron Como, and Anton Suvorov, we see that the melanogaster allele of giant is very similar to that of Tessieri, of that of Yakuba, of pretty much every other species in the melanogaster species group. But there is two key differences with the melanogaster transantomea. There is an amino acid substitution from an alien to an alanine to a valine, and there is an expansion of polycule in the middle of the, of the protein. And here I had to hypothesize again. I had to go and say, well, if there is a polycule expansion, probably we have a phenomenon of phase separation here that actually leads to some differences in viability. So we essentially generated more chimeras. We generated chimeras that actually had the component of the amino acid change from Santomea with the melanogaster number of repeats and vice versa. We generated all the possible intermediates of the evolutionary step. And that's what I am showing here in this plot. What you have in the X is the relative viability and the four possible stages of the protein. And what you will see is that if we, for example, have, in this case, the Yakuba allele is, very, is, is identical to the melanogaster. If we have the Yakuba element that it has a, a polycule, it really doesn't have an effect. If anything, as you can see on the far left, it increases the viability of the fly. Again, my hypothesis while was very incorrect. It was not only that it didn't, have, it didn't have an effect, it had the contrary effect that I was expecting. But the change of the alanine to the valine actually led to an important change here. That very importantly, when we have the two changes together, led to a further reduction of viability. So there is really a phenomenon of intra locus epistasis going on here that we should be paying very, very close attention. In essence, what I am telling you is that we have actually narrowed down the, one of the reasons why these hybrids between melanogaster and Santomea die to a particular gene, giant, to a particular allele, giant from melanogaster, to a particular point mutation that actually narrows it down to try to understand how the phenomenological uh, underpinnings actually take place. I'm not gonna tell you about that yet because we haven't done it, but I'll be back. Part of the phenomenon, part, part of the model that I actually showed you at the beginning, who, what is called the, the dobchansky miller model that has been in place since the 1940s, and part of the elegance of that is that it essentially shows how changes across the phylogeny, that actually there is no force oppose, opposing them at any point, can actually lead to really dramatic reductions of fitness in the hybrids. This is just essentially epistasis 100%. So if I were to actually narrow down the story just to giant, well, it would be interesting, but again, there is here a massive opportunity to try to understand what are the other partners. So one, one experiment that we could do was to try to find out whether there was any autosomal alleles, and there is a reason why it is autosomal, because, well, because it was easier, um, to try to find, to find out if there was any change that modified the penetrance of the giant melanogaster phenotype. So what we did was a rather simple and yet tedious approach of taking the DGRP introgressin and FM7 balancer for multiple generations, which is what I'm showing here in A, and then taking a giant mutant and introgressin and again for multiple generations. So we have an FM7 giant null over 200 different backgrounds and cross that to Santomea. 
And then again, do what you was. And we find a strong association, a very strong association in the tip of the third chromosome. If you're interested in, in embryonic development, you know where I am going with this. Because this haplotype has only a handful of, well, two handfuls, like nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So two hands. One of them being tailless. I am not, no disrespect to any of the other alleles, but tailless has been verified to actually interact genetically with giant. So here we have a hypothesis. When we generated CRISPR null mutants for melanogaster and Santomero, because we did both, what we find is that I'm going to walk from my right to the left. So I'll start with the right. This is my right. When we remove giant from melanogaster, that increases the viability of the hybrids. No surprise there. That's what I have been telling you for exactly 21 minutes. When we remove tailless from melanogaster, that has really no effect on the viability. And that, that was a surprise. I don't know why, but to me, it did surprise me. We will remove the two of them, giant melanogaster and tailless from melanogaster. The viability is much higher than in any of the two deletions by themselves. The key part is that when we remove tailless from Santomea, really, it doesn't have an effect either when there is giant present from melanogaster or no giant present from melanogaster, that is what the two dots on the side are showing. There's just no effect. This leads me to the conclusion that tailless and, tailless and giant alleles from melanogaster are interacting to some extent genetically to actually cause hybrid viability. Not saying that actually there is direct contact because I don't have evidence for that. But the two of them are contributing to the phenomenon of abdominal ablations. Again, I wanna be clear. I'm not actually going full reductionist here, even though I just told you that there is a single mutation that leads to hybrid viability, but I'm not going full reductionist saying that this is the only allele that matters. It's a highly complex and dynamic model. And I'm just choosing one of the paths. But this leads us to important conclusions. Namely, if you remember, we can actually do several, I, I told you this a few minutes ago that there's actually multiple hybrids that can be produced in melanogaster in the melanogaster species group. There's an another, another hybrid that actually we have been pursuing. And there is a cross between melanogaster females and the CRE males. Same phenomenon. Hybrid females survive, hybrid males die. But in this case, the hybrid males die as larvae. They don't die as embryos. So the this essentially led us to the hypothesis that the phenomenon that actually kills the hybrids is different. It's not the gap gene interaction. And when we actually do complementation tests for gap genes and the CRE, we see no effect on viability of those alleles in particular. So to re essentially recap what I have been telling you so far before we move to the larger conclusions. There is a change in the gap genes that actually has happened in melanogaster. But given that actually, if you remember the four slide, I actually show that Simulans, Mauritiana, and to some extent, Seychelles, Seychelles is a difficult species to work with, but at least what is restricted to Simulans and Mauritiana, if we cross them to, to Santomea males, those hybrid males and some hybrid females actually show abdominal ablations. There is evidence, that is evidence that the change of giant is not exclusive from melanogaster, but actually precedes the split between melanogaster and simulans at least. So at some point here shown by that blue dotted line is where that change occur. But the fact that actually the hybrids between melanogaster or antesiary or simulans and antesiary don't show abdominal ablation. Tell me that there is another change here that remains unidentified. It's not giant, it's not tailless. There is a third partner here that we have not been able to pinpoint yet. We are pursuing it. It has proven challenging, but we are pursuing it. But that change happened after Santomea and Tessieri split, which is here shown by that, that dotted red line. The importance of this finding is large for the speciation field because we are at a point in which I am certain that for the next five to six years, we're gonna see an increase in 
what we see identify as hybrid invac compatibilities, and that's an exciting time. That's the time that we're going to be able to actually narrow down whether there are particular patterns that lead to reproductive isolation and larger to speciation. But in this particular case, the one that I am showing you today is not related to speciation whatsoever. Not only that, I, am, I suspect that it was not related to speciation. I am showing you evidence that the components of the hybrid viability evolve at different points of the phylogeny. As it is shown here by these dotted lines. And as such, there is really no evidence. And there is evidence against the model that giant tailors and the third partner were involved in any process of the speciation in this clade. So in this case, the evolution of hybrid compatibilities is just completely decoupled from a speciation. And that's an important distinction to make. The fact that we can narrow down alleles that are involved in hybrid compatibilities doesn't make them what is called a speciation genes. There, there's plenty of beautiful examples of genetics that actually have identified the first changes, but this is not one of them. And if I am so bold, I'm gonna suggest that probably the allele that we are missing in Santomera is probably also a gap gene. Here I show you in red that Giant and Taylor are involved in somehow the phenomenon of calcium hybrid compatibilities and abdominal ablation. But we are pursuing the Theralia and my suspicion or my hypothesis, which admittedly at this point in the last 27 minutes, I have shown you that I have been plenty of times incorrect. But, but my suspicion is that is one of these ones that is actually interacting with these two. More generally, I think that there is an important concept here is that hybrid viability and hybrid compatibility actually show you not only how speciation proceeds, but most importantly, how divergence at large proceeds. The segmentation is very similar in this species. Gap genes all, all have, a role, have, have a role on the development of flies at large, but there is some fine genetic underpinnings that actually have changed. And the reasons for that are actually multiple. It might be selection somewhere else in the genome. We find no selection here. Um, in any of these alleles. And if anything, there are some of the slowest genes in the whole genome to evolve. But the experiment that actually we landed on that was hybrid viability is telling us something about how the systems are divergent, even though the body plan is very similar across the species. Want to finalize, um, listen to some of the people that actually have done the work and the funding agencies um, and my colleagues who actually have had the patience to sit on the board multiple times with me. And I would love to have questions, to take questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll ask the first and the most obvious question. So as you know, there's a lot of literature looking at the evolution of enhancers, yes. especially segmentation gene enhancers across the Rhizophila species. Most of that work is done on the assumption that the transcription factor binding sites are conserved yes. between species. So have you tried to see if giant actually, but if the giant's proteins from different species actually have the same binding affinity? That is a fantastic question and it's one that I don't have an answer for yet, but we're actively working. When Han is actually doing a set of, like a very large set of experiments of cut and run to try to address whether that is the case or not. So I would like to have an answer soon. Perhaps you said this and I missed it, but that alanine to valine change and the extra glutamines, where are they in the protein and is it affecting the structure or interaction with other in hip, you know, partners or whatever. Absolutely, that's a fantastic question. For the polycules, we they are outside of the DNA domain, DNA binding domain, in a largely uncharacterized region of the of the protein. So we don't know still if it affects the, the the structure or not. But at least we know that it's not within that DNA binding domain that we were mostly interested in. All right. So I have a. Uh... How are you doing? I've got one from the uh, uh, chat here. So great talk. It is interesting that both genes you found, giant and talus, are gap genes in the same network. Have you looked at the expression pattern of gap genes in early embryos in the two species, uh, these two genes and other genes? As far as we're concerned, they look very similar in the two species. If you change the relative expression of giant and talus in Melanogaster, can you come close to 
what you see in the hybrid inviability? That's a great question. We have tried multiple ways to try to recapitulate the phenotypic defect that we see in the hybrids. And there is no mutant or expression pattern that actually leads to such a strong abdominal ablation. Do you have any intuition or evidence about whether there's positive selection or neutral evolution going on with this cryptic evolution? Absolutely, that's a fantastic question. Um, we have actually done pretty much every, every assessment of positive selection that we can think of. We have done PAML, McDonald Kreiman, and there is no selection on any of these two genes. Uh, as a matter of fact, giant falls within the 25 bottom percentile uh, in terms of uh, molecular, in rates of molecular evolution in the genome uh, across all the species of the melanogaster group. So that's not really the reason why this is a phenomenon. That being said, I am not ruling out selection as a driving force because it might be selection somewhere else in the pathway that actually leads to essentially a runaway model that would lead to uh, uh, developmental systems drift. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Daniel. Okay, thank you, Danielle. And our last final speaker for the session is Marco Milan, and he is gonna talk about the tissue biology of chromosomal instability. Thank you. Uh, the pointer is not working, no? The pointer is not working here? Yeah. 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 So I pass back to the here. No, it's okay. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, organizers, to, to you know, to give me the opportunity to, you know, to uh, share with all of you what we have done in the lab. So uh, my name is Marco Milan and I'm in Barcelona, in Spain, in the RB. And what I'm going to tell you is, you know, what we have done in the last few years about, you know, understanding what is the impact at the tissue-wide level of chromosomal instability <laughs> using Drosophila, of course, as a model system. So what is first chromosomal instability is the persistently high rate of loss and gain of whole chromosomes or part of them during mitosis. So it's a consequence of missegregation of chromosomes during mitosis. And one of the consequences of chromosomal instability is the generation of the so-called aneuploid karyotypes, so the unbalanced set of chromosomes, the wrong number of chromosomes in, in an unbalanced way. Not only that, also a chromosomal instability induces DNA damage. So those uh, uh, chromosomes that are uh, wrongly attached to the uh, microtubules coming from the different uh, spindle poles are uh, also broken during mitosis. And there is also a consequence of generation of macronuclei. So those chromosomes that are not attached to the, to the microtubules might end as a, uh, in, the, in the macronuclei. So why to study chromosomal stability? Why we started uh, doing that? Is because you know, most solid tumors in humans are aneuploid, high, high levels of uh, aneuploidy, as you can see here by you know, a very complex karyotypes being found. <laughs> the second one is that you know, uh, no chromosome signature is, is found in many cancers. Of course, you know, the, the idea or the model or the most popular model nowadays uh, about the possible uh, role of chromosomal instability in tumorogenesis is a way of cancer cells to gain chromosomes carrying oncogenes and loss chromosomes uh, losing uh, tumor suppressor genes just to, to become a winner cell. However, you know, uh, many, many tumors don't show a particular chromosome signature. So there's not a single gene or chromosome which appears to affect or contribute to the tumor genesis of the, of the tumors. But first and second, and based on the fact that most solid tumors have high levels of chromosome instability, understanding what are the stresses that the tissue and the cell uh, are somehow suffering is a good idea to uh, in look for the Achilles heel of these tumors. 
So what are the particularities of Drosophila? So I, I know, so you are a Drosophila audience, so I'm not going to tell you how many chromosomes there are. But I think something that is very important is only two and a half chromosomes are, uh, you know, in Drosophila, which means that the consequence of chromosome instability of the generation of the anoploid karyotypes are karyotype independent impact. In other terms, all the cellular behaviors that we might be able to find and identify are not the consequence of the a gain or loss of a particular chromosome carrying a particular gene. Because, you know, if you induce aneuploid karyotypes, uh, unbalanced karyotypes, you induce aneuploid for around 20% of the whole genome. So is this what, what uh, people uh, working with mammals call, uh, you know, uh, complex karyotypes. So what we, you know, try to understand or to, in, in all this uh, uh, talk is, you know, what is the, the, the role of aneuploid per se in a karyotype independent map. So it's just what the generation of an endoplate uh, karyotype is doing in terms of the emerging cell behaviors and the response of the tissue independently of which chromosome is being gained or is being uh, lost. <laughs> and of course, you know, Drosophila is good because, you know, you can induce chromosome stability by different means. And to understand what are the commonalities, whether you are interfering with the spin assembly checkpoint, the coercion complex, and the central some loss and amplification. All of them are leading to exactly the same effects. So generation of aneuploid karyotypes, generation of the chromosome instability. And we use as a model system the Rosophila wing primordium, highly proliferative monolayer epithelium that divides, uh, you know, in four days around 1,000 times, so, in, in, so increases in, in, in size. And then you can, you know, uh, beautifully or nicely manipulate that uh, genetically in time and space, and we can track what are uh, the cells doing when a tissue is subject to chromosome instability. So this journey started a long time ago by these uh, three people, Andres, uh, Lara, and Mariana, Musupapa. And uh, the first thing that we found, so what we did is, you know, so we, we manipulated, we induced chromosome instability on the right side of the wing primordium in the posterior compartment. And if you use chromosome stability by different means independently, so sac depletion, centrosome amplification, coercion complex, etc., etc., in all the cases, there is a lot of cell death in, in the tissue. And then this cell death relies on the activity of GNK. So if you block GNK, now cell death is, is very much reduced. So if you block apoptosis, if you maintain uh, so uh, those, uh, you know, this apoptosis, you, you, you block it. But you can see here as you transform a normal wing primordium into a tissue overgrowth, as you can see here. So the posterior cell, which is subject to chromosomal stability, and is here leveled in green, largely uh, overgrowth. And then this uh, tissue overgrowth appears to be unlimited. So you can take a piece of the tissue to transplant into the abdomen of a, of a, a female a fly, adult fly. And uh, after around 20 days, this increase in size of around 1,000 times. And you can do that uh, in an in a indefinite uh, manner. Not only that, you know, some of these uh, 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 in allograph experiments, some of these GFP positive cells can be found in <coughs> the uh, uh, organs of the host, as you can see here in the ovaries. So some cells labeled by GFP and P35, that's the way we block apoptosis, can be found in these cells. And then not only that, but also, you know, these tumors or these tumor-like overgrowth are inducing malignancy. So these larvae never enter into population and ultimately they will die. <laughs> so after finding this kind of tissue-wide and organism-wide uh, 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 effects of chromosome instability, the next step what we have done in the last few years is to uh, identify which are the cellular and molecular mechanisms driving uh, tumor-like uh, overgrowth, metastasis, or you know, invasiveness and uh, malignancy. So, and what we found is, as you know, as a spoiler of this, you know, this part is under this a leading role of aneuploid cells. The, the aneuploid cells do a lot. <laughs> what we found is, if you induce chromosome instability and we block apoptosis. There's always on the basal side of the epithelium, a group of cells that are being accumulated there. These cells are indeed those cells that have made a mistake in the chromosome segregation and carry highly aneuploid karyotypes. Here uh, being identified by you know, DNA uh, content profile, <coughs> which is absolutely aberrant, and uh, by fish against the different chromosomes by carrying <coughs> a wrong number of chromosomes. 
So why sell when the cam so has an aneuploid color types delaminates? We have played just to make a, you know, a short, a long story short. What we have played is with the dosage compensation mechanism. So we have a, a isolated wing primordia from female and male larvae. And what we have found is that, you know, cells upon chromosomal stability can change the number of chromosomes from two X to one or from one X to two, only in the case uh, these cells are able to reset the dosage compensation mechanism. If these cells change the number of X chromosomes and they are not able to reset the dosage compensation mechanism, then these cells will die in the JNK dependent manner in a similar way as unemployed cells uh, do. <laughs> Somehow suggesting that uh, the way or the reason why these cells delaminate is a consequence of gene dosage imbalance and is not a consequence of kind of you know, the structural thing about you know, having a wrong number of chromosomes. These cells, once they don't delaminate, as I told you, they activate the JNK signaling pathway, they induce the expression of MMPs, and they degrade the uh, basement membrane. And this is a prerequisite for these cells to become invasive. And in the last few years, what we have <laughs> identified is the mechanism, the molecular mechanism by which these cells delaminate basally and are able to move and to invade the neighboring compartment, the neighboring territory. And we have identified a leading role of JNK <laughs> by JNK by modulating the actomycin cytoskeleton, make these cells uh, motile and invasive. <laughs> these tumors or this tumor like overgrowth, so the, 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 the unlimited growth potential of the tissues, relies on the activity of the signaling of a, a single secretive protein, which is called wingless, which is expressed here in these cells, in the uh, aneuploid cells. <laughs> if you remove an enhancer by CRISPR Cas9 uh, of wingless, that has AP1 binding size, so responds uh, exclusively to a GNK activity. As you can see here, these uh, uh, tissues are not able to grow in allograft experiments. This deletion of these flies, so this of this enhancer, does not have absolutely any role on the dental role of, of, of wingless during uh, development. <laughs> okay, so you know, so we have you know identified the molecular makers behind invasiveness tissue growth and uh, uh, so, uh, leading roles are of JNK in invasiveness, tissue growth, and malignancy. But in the last few years, what we realized is that, you know, these aneuploids, the cells enter kind of a senescence-like state. And by senescence-like states, so we, sorry. So uh, what we found out is that, you know, these cells, are uh, you know uh, increasing so the Golgi apparatus here labeled you know the uh, epithelial cells versus the laminating cells increase the ER. <laughs> Some are suggesting that they are highly secretory. We have done a transcriptomic analysis you know to see which genes are upregulated in these particular cells in these aneuploid cells, and you can see here there's a large collection of secreted proteins here you know, the uh, vertebrate uh, homologs, as you can see here so they become highly secretory. One of them is wingless, the one I was telling you, MMPs in order to degrade the basement membrane, but also many other proteins that have not only local effect, but also systemic effects, as I will let you know at the end of the, of, of the talk. <laughs> These cells also become, uh, the, the nuclei become large, yeah, as to compare with epithelial, normal epithelial cells, and these cells are much, much uh, bigger, which is also a future of senescence. Another future is, you know, uh, gain damage, as you can see here, both by uh, cometa C of these cells or by phosphate 2 v uh, labeling. These cells are suffering a, a good uh, so a amount of gain damage. The chromatin is uh, heterochromatized here by labeling by HP1 RFP here in these uh, delaminating cells. And most interestingly, these cells are in the cell cycle. They don't show any mitotic activity, and by EDU staining, BRDU staining, they are uh, not positively labeled. And by using, you know, both uh, DNA content profile and uh, FlyFuji, what we found out is that these cells are arrested in G2. And lastly, just to confirm that they are, they are entering into a senescence-like state, we do the classical uh, senescence-associated beta galactosis activity in a low pH uh, condition. As you can see here, in a normal situation, there's only a group of cells, 
that show this uh, senescence-like uh, state in the hinge of the wing primordium upon chromosomal stability, the whole tissue, or the, mainly the anoplot cells are labeled in green here. And so a monitor so of showing the senescent associated beta galactosidase activity. <laughs> so senescence is uh, classically known in mammals to be regulated by P53 and P21, the capo and drosophila. As you can see here, both P53 and P21 are activated in these cells. However, senescence, none of the phenotypes that we observe in these cells relies on the activity of P53 and P21. <laughs> As I told you before, JNK has a leading role in making you know, these tumors, invasiveness, et cetera, et cetera. We wonder whether JNK was the driving force or the driving molecules in uh, these cells into the senescence-like state. <laughs> and the answer is yes. As you can see here, uh, tissues uh, subject to chromosomal stability, those aneuploid cells are labeled by this senescent associated beta uh, activity uh, uh, kit. And if you block JNK, now this uh, turns black. Not only that, the cell cycle arrest of these cells relies on JNK. If you block JNK now, the cells are able to divide and these cells are able in, uh, to enter into uh, a space. <laughs> Also, in other two futures, so the size of the nuclei, the oops, the size of the cells is also a consequence of JNK activation. If you block JNK, as you can see here, now the nuclei are not that big and the cells are not uh, that big here, very nicely quantified. And finally, uh, so most or many of the, of the proteins of the genes that they are encoding for security factors that are specifically upregulating these cells rely on the activity of JNK. So they are JNK targets. <laughs> so these cells enter into a senescence-like state, and this uh, senescence-like state is a consequence of JNK activation. And the next question that we wanted to, to address is how an anoploid karyotype, a gene dosage imbalance, is translated into JNK activation, which are the uh, uh, molecular or cellular events that are taking place in a cell that, uh, that are being used in order to translate uh, anoploid, anoploid karyotype into the activation of this particular pathway. And then <laughs> we are very, you know, very much uh, uh, influenced by the work of Angelica Anmon uh, in yeast and Susanna Storkova in human cells. And what they found is that, you know, by making uh, anoploid human cell lines or anoploid yeast, uh, what they show is this uh, anoploid is translated into gene dosage imbalance. This gene dosage imbalance is induced is translated in protein imbalance. So if you have the wrong number of chromosomes, imagine here wrong number, more chromo uh, chromosomes of chromosome three. So all the genes and proteins that are being encoded by these uh, chromosomes are uh, uh, expressed at higher rates than the chromosome two. And as a consequence, this induces a stress, an imbalance in the stoichiometry of the major protein quality uh, on, the, on the protein complexes that are involved in the uh, most important cellular aspects of uh, you know, the, 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 the cell cycle, like mitosis, replication, metabolism, etc. So this then induces a large amount of protein aggregates, and there are some cells, some proteins that have to be degraded. So this ultimately leads to protein stress. So we wonder whether the, our, our aneuploid cells in Drosophila were suffering of uh, protein stress, and the answer is yes. We were labeled with REF2, which you know labels these protein aggregates, these proteins that are going to be degraded through the protosome and autophagy uh, pathway. And you can see here REF2 positive uh, dots that are also labeled by ubiquitin. So those proteins that are going to be degraded by the protosomes are largely ubiquitinated. <laughs> Not only that, so this protein stress, what we found out that <laughs> leads to the activation of the major protein quality control mechanism, autophagy here, labeled by uh, ATG. So as you can see here, ATG positive dots are highly increased in the anoplate cells with respect to the rest uh, of the cells. <laughs> and we found also that the protosome itself is highly saturated and the UPR is activated. All the branches of the UPR are highly activated in these cells. <laughs> what we found, so someone suggesting or indicating that, you know, this protein, this uh, gene dosage imbalance is translated into a protein imbalance. This induces high levels of protective stress. And as a consequence, the, the, ma the major protein quality control mechanisms are activated and uh, uh, saturated. 
But what we found, so what we identified a few years ago, is that the major source of GNK activation and senescence in these cells is ROS production. So the mechanism is very easy. So as one, which is a, a ROS sensor, is the major driving force of gene activation, activation in these particular cells. <laughs> so here you can see here some high levels of ROS in these anoplast cells. And what we found in the last few years is these high levels of ROS are mainly mitochondrial ROS. If we use a mitochondrial ROS marker, mitosox, as you can see here, there are very high levels of mitochondrial ROS in these cells. Somehow pointing to the idea or to the model that the major source of ROS production are most probably dysfunctional uh, mitochondria. And what is the connection between having the most, the uh, major protein quality control mechanism saturated and mitochondrial dysfunction? And the model or the, the hypothesis was the following. In a situation in which uh, autophagy is dealing with high levels of the stress, the mitochondria that need to be uh, remove the unhealthy mitochondria by uh, uh, mitophagy might not be removed, might be accumulated, might be this dysfunctional mitochondria, uh, might be the ones that are the major source of ROS. <laughs> and our, our hypothesis appeared to be true. What we found is that these cells, these highly anoplaid cells, accumulate <laughs> a, a very high number of mitochondria. These mitochondria are not healthy, so they are not long and filamentous. They are uh, round and, uh, you know, uh, fission was being induced. These mitochondria appear to be highly oxidized using mitotimer as a readout. These mitochondria <laughs> co stain with REF2 uh, dots, so were highly labeled with REF2, and also were uh, co localizing with uh, ATG8 uh, positive dots. Not only that, what we found is that, you know, indeed, you know, uh, according to our hypothesis, mitophagy was highly saturated and dysfunctional. So we use a mitophagy marker, as you can see here in normal tissues, so it, that, that relies also is a targets the mitochondria with the GFP and RFP uh, uh, fluorophores. And once the, uh, the mitochondria get into the lysosomes, the low pH points of the GFP specifically and not the RFP. As you can see here in normal situation, there are some mitochondria that get into lysosomes, labeled only in red. In a situation of high levels of chromosomal stability in those anoplasts, cells, as you can see here, there's a strong labeling of mitochondria, so high levels of, um, high, le high numbers of mitochondria, and many of these dots are not red anymore, are yellow, somehow suggesting that these accumulated mitochondria did not enter into the, li the, the lysosomes. So what I've shown you is more or less, you know, the pathway by which an anoploid karyotype is translated into the activation of a particular pathway, JNK that drives SNSS-like state. <laughs> but the last thing that we wanted to address is, you know, why senescence? Why the tissue needs senescence? Has uh, any role in tissue homeostasis? <laughs> and then we move into a completely different model. We use the eye as a model system which is a very highly sensitive. So in this particular case, we induce chromosomal stability without blocking cell death. So random chromosome misegregation. <laughs> and most of the flies, so around 80% of the flies, show this kind of rough phenotype, so small uh, eye phenotype, and the flies are completely fine. And then we tested whether by interfering with this uh, whole pathway, what happens to the other uh, tissue-wide level of these high levels of chromosomal stability. What we found is that in this particular uh, background, if we deplete uh, elements or uh, subunits of the protosome uh, pathway of the protosome uh, machinery, so by depleting by using RNA lines that have no major consequence in normal development. So this kind of partial deletion of the protosome, as you can see, here, has dramatic consequence in those tissues that are subject to chromosome stability. <laughs> Somehow suggesting or, or reinforcing our uh, idea that the Proteasome is highly saturated and partial depletion has a, a very a big consequence in those tissues subject to chromosomal stability, but not to uh, normal tissues. Exactly the same if you, uh, if we were able, you know, we were interfering with autophagy, uh, we were interfering with uh, lysosomal biogenesis or biology in general, no major consequence during normal development, uh, very strong consequence in those tissues that are subject to chromosomal stability. 
depleting only parking, so which is being involved in metaphasy, as you can see here, has a strong consequence in tissues uh, uh, subject to chromosome instability. And, but no, we were not able only to, to rescue, but we were also were to, to enhance, but also to rescue. If in, in a tissue, which is subject to chromosome instability, we increase, we induce autophagy, we rescue the phenotype, largely the phenotype, and then we rescue to over the spin. If we promote mitophagy, or we induce uh, the expression of Ross scavengers or mitochondrial chaperons, as you can see here, we get more or less normal eyes. Some are suggesting or indicating that this uh, you know, activation of these uh, pathways are uh, somehow uh, buffering the deleterious effect of chromosomal instability in terms of cell death. <laughs> And lastly, what we wonder is you know, whether, okay, so all these mechanisms, so protein quality control mechanisms, mitophagy, are being involved. So if we uh, uh, upregulate or downregulate all these pathways, this has a strong effect at the tissue wide level on those cells, on those tissues that uh, are subject to chromosome instability. But what happens if we block GNK? We don't allow the cells entering into a senescent state. <laughs> and the answer is dramatic. We block GNK in this case, so in a normal, uh, I, there is no major effect. There is a strong effect in terms of tissue size. So the, 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 the size collapses. We, we don't allow the cells uh, to enter into, into a senescent uh, like state. And this is uh, uh, <coughs> uh, also shown in, you know, in, 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 in tissues that are developing upon chromosomal instability. This induces compensatory cell proliferation, so high mitotic activity in the tissue in order to repair the loss of cells by anoplity, by misaggregation of chromosomes. If you block JNK now, the tissue does not respond. <laughs> but JNK is not only having a role in driving compensatory proliferation. What we found out is that if you block JNK in these cells, autophagy and lysosomal biogenesis is somehow a compromise in these uh, cells, in these tissues. So, so far, what I've shown you <laughs> is that we have delineated the pathway by which in a tissue which is subject to chromosome instability, <laughs> those cells that delaminate, those cells that have an anoploid karyotype delaminate, and why, what are the mechanisms by which anoploidy is translated into gene activation and to entry into a senescent state, and why the entry into a senescent state? What, has, what are the consequences at the tissue wide level? And what I've shown you is that JNK has a role, so these senescent cells drive the expression, sorry, of, uh, uh, I didn't have time to, to show you, and PERTs, which are the ones, the major drivers to the JAXAS pathway in inducing the activation of the protein quality control mechanism. And senescence has also a role uh, by driving the expression of uh, matogenic molecules in inducing compensatory proliferation and driving uh, tissue homeostasis. And in the last few minutes, what I'm going to show you is, you know, finally, so what we found out is that about the systemic effect of these tissues on chromosome stability. As I told you, this, uh, this larvae carrying uh, uh, tumor-like of the growth uh, are delayed in development, not, don't, not enter into uh, metamorphosis and ultimately die. And as, as you know, so you know, so the transition from larvae into metamorphosis rely on the dyson in flies and insects, and relies on the activation of the expression of esteroid hormones in us in humans. And what we found out is that those in those larvae that carry this thin induced tumor of a growth don't enter into metamorphosis; they stay always in the larval state. And just to make a short story, a long story short. So this uh, prodrolacrin gland is the, the, the tissue devoted to induce egg dyson production and the driving from larva into uh, uh, pupa. And what we found is that these uh, uh, tissues that uh, are subject to high levels of chromosome instability, these senescent cells activate and express the ligand and PER3, which is interleukin-6 in, in vertebrates. And this is the one that is traveling from these senescent-like states, uh, senescent states, uh, cells, into the proteinographic gland, activates the Jackstat pathway, and blocks completely the Dyson production. And just to finish, uh, this is uh, you know, the work that has been done by all these people that are not in the lab anymore. And these are the group nowadays in, in my lab. And this is the funding uh, you know, uh, agencies that have allowed us to, to work on that. And everything has been done in Barcelona, in Spain, far away from here. Okay, sorry if I was too long. I'm happy to take questions.